Wonderful. So um, I am uh, pleased to uh, have uh, Dr. Manali Patel here with us. Um, she is uh, the assistant professor uh, in the division of oncology at Stanford University, and she's also staff oncologist at VA Palo Alto Healthcare System. She obtained her, um, uh, her medical degree and master's in public health at UNC Chapel Hill and completed her internal medicine residency fellowship in hematology and oncology and master's in science in, in health services research at Stanford University. Dr. Patel's uh, research involves uh, evaluating systems level and social factors that influence disparities in cancer and value-based care delivery. Her expertise lies in designing, implementing, and evaluating new models of cancer care delivery with academic uh, community and VA oncology practices aimed to improve patient experiences with care, clinical outcomes, and reduce unwanted healthcare utilization and health disparities. Dr. Patel also has expertise in linking large cancer registries to investigate modifiable etiologies for disparate care receipt among populations. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for your time uh, and for being here. Um, I, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Oh, you are muted. You are muted, Dr. Patel. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for that introduction and also for inviting me to speak. I really want this to be interactive. Um, I just want to take a moment before we start. It's been a very um, difficult time in our world and in the United States. And the events yesterday hit home for me, um, as I'm sure it does for all of you. Um, it's dreadful to think about the state of the world right now, but there is hope. And I think the work that we're doing at Stanford makes me optimistic and makes me excited to come to work after such events um, that we continue to hear. So. I um, want to acknowledge um, many of you on the call and who I know. I'm so excited to see um, some folks. Donna Williams is on our community advisory board um, for one large study, and Jessica, who um, has been a pleasure to work with um, in the KL2 program and continuing. So it's nice to see some familiar faces. Please do ask questions as we go along. Um, again, I want this to be interactive and for you all to have a chance to answer questions. So um, the course objectives, I was asked to give quite a broad um, overview of cancer. So I tried my best to um, sprinkle in a little bit about cancer basics for many of you all who may not have worked in the cancer space. It may be a bit too general for you, Donna and others who are in the cancer space, but I think it's really important to have that foundation of knowledge. And then um, think about cancer epidemiology, but really thinking about applying those principles of cancer epidemiology. I also think it's really important to think about screening and prevention. That's a huge pillar of our treatment um, and also the directions that we're going in as a nation as well as um, globally. And then instead of the principles of DNA, really thinking about our ZNA, meaning our zip code as etiologies for disparities in cancer. And I'll talk a lot about some of the structural issues um, and structural barriers that lead to disparities across the cancer continuum analyzing these barriers that lead to disparate care. And then I really want you all to take away some action items of what you can do today, tomorrow, and in the future um, to overcome barriers in current cancer care delivery. So again, basics, um, cancer, what is it? Many of you all probably know, but it's interesting to go back and look at kind of definitions and descriptions of what cancer is. It's really uncontrolled cell growth in parts of the body. And it can start anywhere in the body. So you can have a cancer that can start in the lungs, you can have a cancer that starts in the prostate, you can have a cancer that starts in the colon, really anywhere or in the brain. Um, but they differ really, the cancer cells differ from normal cells. And the key differences are that they often grow without signals of when to grow. So most normal cells get a signal for when to proliferate. They also ignore signals that tell them to die or to stop growing. So that leads to uncontrolled growth. They can invade into many other parts of the body. 
And the interesting aspect of cancer cells is that they can tell blood vessels to grow toward it. So they can create their own microenvironment, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, to help them to proliferate even more and to get the nutrients that they need. Many cancers can hide from the immune system. So our immune system will recognize some cancers, but there are some cancers that will evade uh, immune response. And they can accumulate changes over time that then lead it to resist certain treatments. So they are able to morph pretty quickly because they have this rapid cell growth cycle. And again, they rely on many different nutrients. Normal cells do as well, but their pathways of utilizing the nutrients into conversion into energy and replication, it's really a, a very different process altogether. Why is this important? Because this is how many of our research, which I'm gonna talk about later at the end of the slide in terms of interventional therapeutics really depend on these mechanisms and the differences between normal cancer growth versus cancer cell growth. So DNA changes can really cause genes that are involved in our normal cell growth to become oncogenes. And these oncogenes um, are that, that they just can't be turned off. So they control and they lead to rapid proliferation and rapid uncontrolled cell growth. We have genes in our body called tumor suppressor genes. And so in normal genes or normal cells, these genes tell cells to stop growing. So as I mentioned before, we don't have signals in these cancer cells because they inactivate those tumor suppressor genes. So they suppress, cancer cells suppress the tumor suppressor gene, and that leads to this uncontrolled growth. Now, this is very simplistic, but just a very basic background. As I mentioned before, tumors create what's called a tumor microenvironment. And Many of our drugs currently that fight cancer can affect the tumor microenvironment. Um, this microenvironment is a way of the tumor setting up almost a home for itself, where it's surrounded by everything that it needs, including immune cells, blood vessels, fibroblasts, and it determines the microenvironment really determines how cancer grows, how it spreads, and is really important, as I mentioned, for treatment options. As I mentioned as well, the immune system um, is our number one defense system in our body. Um, you know, sadly, as we've seen with COVID-19, um, our immune system does not always um, mount the response we want, it does, but it can't always fight the response specifically around cancer. It is very difficult because many cancer cells can detect, they can avoid detection by the immune system, they can also thwart an attack. And currently, as many of you may have heard, and we'll talk about in the treatment, um, in the treatment aspect of this talk, that some treatments can help the immune system better detect and kill cancer cells. So immunotherapy, which has been a dramatic improvement in terms of the way that we treat cancer, now can help people to fight cancer itself, detect this, the cancer, and actually attack the cancer. So it helps our immune system to work better. There are genetic changes within cancer. So our own genes are different. So I'm different than Ms. Saba. I'm different than many people on the phone call. We may have shared DNA and we have shared genetic changes, but as we all know, we all have our unique combination of genetic changes as does cancer. So I hate the term of your cancer and my cancer because that takes ownership and um, many people and patients don't like the concept of owning their cancer. Um, and so I, I tend to use verbiage that is the cancer or the cancer that's in the body. Um, everyone's cancer, again, that's again a possessive word, but the cancer that's in a particular person has its own genetic makeup. And it has its own way of changing and morphing within a particular person. And so it makes it difficult, as you can imagine, to understand what the implications may be for treatment for each individual person without knowing the genetic makeup of the cancer itself. And so now with technology, we've been able to genomically map the cancers itself so that we can determine what treatments may be best for an individual person and that cancer that that individual person may have in their body. 
These specific genetic changes are really important because we know that these genetic changes within the cancer may make it more or less likely to respond to certain treatments. And that has been a huge paradigm shift in the way that we have approached cancer treatment and research over the past few years. Now, everyone has a different staging mechanism but, um, for cancer, depending on where it may be in the body. So we use, usually use a tumor node metastasis marker, which is called the TNM. So there are different aspects that go into staging a cancer. And again, this may be so basic, but I do think it's important to understand just the, the basic fundamental knowledge before we get into some of the issues with disparities. Stage one cancer, at least for most cancers, again, this is a, a boiled down version of staging, um, but for most cancers, we stage at least the solid tumor cancers, not necessarily the blood cancers, in a stage one through four. One means that the cancer is generally localized to a very small area of the body. It hasn't really morphed or spread to lymph nodes or to other areas in the body. And it's usually pretty small. Stage two means that it, the tumor itself in that T and M category, but the T, the tumor size is bigger, but it hasn't yet spread. Now, again, this is general. So, you know, there may be some spread and some stage twos, depending on what cancer, but in general, it hasn't really spread too far away from the original site of the tumor or hasn't spread at all. And so stage one and stage two, I would say most of us argue that these stages of cancer are curable. Stage three is concerning because not only has the tumor itself grown, but it has also spread to other lymph nodes. So now the N for lymph nodes is involved. And that means that it's harder to treat because the cancer has spread. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's incurable, but certainly harder to treat cancer when they've more advanced. Yes. Does someone have a question or can we mute? Any questions? I, I think it was just an accident, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Um, stage four cancer has spread to other organs or to other areas of the body. That means that it has what we call metastasized. And stage four cancer means that the cancer itself, for example, if you have a cancer that's in the colon, that cancer has now broken away and has traveled through the blood or the lymph system to another part of the body. So the image here shows that this tumor that was originally in the colon has now traveled to the lung. And while it's not a lung cancer, it's still the colon cancer. It has now made its way through either the blood or the lymph system to go to another part of the body and continue to invade in another part of the body. It is really hard to treat these individuals that may have metastatic cancer. And so stage four is often considered incurable. And we do have ways to prolong life, but overall, most of us would agree that patients with stage four are unlikely to ever, for us to ever really get rid of that cancer. I'm gonna stop here and see if there are any questions about just that brief overview before jumping into treatments in the next section. Okay, please. Um, I'm not monitoring the chat, so I don't know if questions are coming. So please um, you know, please just interrupt and ask questions if you need to, or I think Ms. Saba is, is looking through the chat as well. Yes, I will monitor the chats, no worries. Thank you. I'll let you know, thank you. Thank you. So our cancer treatments, this is an area of excitement for me because um, in the brief time, I guess it's been, I'm trying to remember when I finished officially fellowship, I believe it was 2008, 2009, no, 2011. So in the brief time that I've been an attending over the past you know, 10, 12 years, um, the way that we treat cancer has changed a lot. Um, so my main area of focus is lung cancer, which um, for years and decades had been a really underfunded and under therapeutically changing environments. We were using drugs that really we've been using for decades 
without much advancement. And now um, I have just in my clinic yesterday, I call it my panel of well babies. All of them had stage four cancer when they were first diagnosed. And it's been over three years that they've been living. Whereas prior to the recent advancements in immunotherapy, um, they would have passed away at least within six months or a year. Um, so it's really exciting for me to see these changes and also see the dramatic improvements that we're making in people's lives. Um, our cancer treatments are really consisting of a, a multi-pronged approach. So most of our treatments have a chemotherapy backbone. Chemotherapy is a systemic therapy that's usually provided by vein or by mouth. So you can take, a, um, we now have oral therapeutics as well. People have a misnomer and think that because it's a pill that you can get over the counter, that perhaps the side effects are less, but rather what we found with some of the drugs, at least even in the, the GI space and gastrointestinal cancer space is that they can cause more, if not um, worse side effects than the infusional drugs. These drugs have been the backbone and they're usually provided for people that have a really advanced stage. So, um, you know, if someone, for example, with breast cancer has lymph nodes that are involved, we usually provide this systemic therapy in combination with others. The next picture is our immune therapies. Now, this is really exciting for me, as I mentioned with my anecdote about clinic yesterday, that now we've developed ways for the immune system to help to fight the cancer so that these cancers and that these cancers are not evaded or not um, ignored by the immune system. And so it helps to rev up the immune system such that the immune system is also working in parallel. Most of our immune therapies have less side effects. They're given again at the same cycles. So chemotherapy is dosed on what we call cycles of therapy which is interesting dosing um, and, and was very a hard concept, I think, for people to understand coming into fellowship. Um, each treatment, for example, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, if we add them together, there's an evidence base sometimes, sometimes not, a regimen by which we give these treatments over time. So for example, with a patient that may have a stage four lung cancer, these treatments, we give three different treatments together. The first two are chemotherapy drugs, and we have two different chemotherapy drugs that we give together. We call it a doublet, um, platinum doublet. And these are very old drugs that have been around for, for eons of time. And those are the drugs that I talked about before where really we hadn't been changing our, our therapeutic regimen. You give those drugs separately on the same day. Sometimes you can give them together through the same IV, but usually you wait. Um, so you give one of the drugs and then you follow it up with another drug and some of them have hydration. And then you also give an immunotherapy drug, which may take about 15 minutes. The combination of all three usually takes about four to five hours if um, everything's working well and as planned in our infusion center. Sometimes, sometimes can take longer if we give um, fluids before and after. So a patient is expected to stay there all day. That's considered one cycle. And so three weeks later, they get cycle number two. And so it's the same exact combination. Sometimes we'll make dose reductions and that's considered the next cycle. For years, we were giving cancer chemotherapy drugs for six cycles and then we assess. And now in lung cancer, we've changed. But in general, we all agree that when you get these cycles of drugs, most of them are anywhere from four to six cycles. So you will get these combinations four to six times. So that's again, pushed you into about six months of treatment at least, as long as there's no delay. So every three weeks you're getting these cycles up to six times before you get a scan. Now we do midway scans so that because we've been hearing from folks that there's a lot of sting anxiety. So a lot of anxiousness about wondering whether these drugs are working or not. So we often will get uh, midway through. So if, for example, if you have six cycles that you want to give after the third cycle, we'll get a, a scan to see how the treatments are working and sometimes modify our treatments at that point. The other types of therapies include radiation. So radiation is essentially, you take high dose uh, radiation delivered so similar you know, through a CT scan, but obviously different mechanisms. And there's an image here. It's one of our standards of care where people will may get chemotherapy and they get radiation together. Sometimes you can get radiation alone. 
and there's a combination also with surgery. So for many of the earlier stage cancers, we would like to resect them. We would like to take them out. And this is true probably for all cancers, I would say, is with the exception of blood cancers, which are hard to resect, obviously. Um, but for most solid tumors, if we can catch them early, the best thing to do is to try to remove them, we think. We don't necessarily know. It's hard, for example, now that radiation techniques have gotten so much better. And I'm again going to rely on lung cancer since I treat that. But for example, in lung cancer, our mainstay of treatment has always been to surgically take out the tumor and any lymph nodes that may be involved if they have a stage three. But certainly if a patient has stage one, we take it out. But now treatments um, such as CyberKnife, which is a very advanced method of radiation, it's even considered radio surgery, um, can do the same in terms of we, what we've seen, at least anecdotally and in real world studies at the VA, where some patients just are unable to receive surgery despite having an early stage cancer because of their comorbidities, that the CyberKnife works just as well. But we've yet to do a randomized trial. So most old schoolers think that um, the surgical approach and resection is probably the best therapeutic option. Whereas many of us who have been taking care of patients who can't have surgery are really seeing dramatically um, impressive outcomes with CyberKnife. And then finally, um, stem, stem cell transplantation, where you try to replace um, the stem cells and try to take donor cells that are, that are healthy and replace a person's cells um, with those donor cells that are healthy in hopes to then proliferate um, new cells. So usually you'll, you'll give patients chemotherapy. We give patients very, very high dose chemotherapy to try to get rid of as much of the cancer as possible and deplete all of their cell growth. And then we transplant new cells um, from donors. And it does show the community approach of needing to have other individuals such as blood to blood donation in terms of donating and matching uh, bone marrow. What's wonderful, and again, this goes back to immune therapy and goes back to what I was talking about with DNA changes, is we've now realized that it's not a one size fits all. And it's really important that we genomically look at the cancer itself because it is its own beast. It's its own entity. It has its own microenvironment. It has its own ideas of what it wants to do in the body. And so we now need to figure out what those particular genetic changes are within those cancers. And we've begun to develop specific personalized medicine such that depending on what those genetic changes are, we can then target with particular drugs. So again, lung cancer, many other cancers have targeted agents that go towards those mutations. If there's a mutation in the gene sequence or a biomarker or a molecular marker, so a protein change, we have therapeutics that can directly target those proteins such that it's attacking the cancer itself and not necessarily attacking all of the cells in the body. So the problem with the traditional medicine approaches are that chemotherapy cannot distinguish between cancer cells and the, um, and the normal cells. So individuals may have significant side effects from utilizing chemotherapy with hair falling out, very rapidly proliferating cells are the, most, are the ones that are most likely to be affected. It doesn't mean that the precision medicine tools and techniques and therapies we have don't also have significant side effects, but usually the side effects are different and they're less, and there's usually better outcome when we target the cancer itself. So it is really a paradigm shift in the way that we've been thinking about approaching cancer and gives me great hope in terms of uh, what we can do to prolong the lives and improve quality of life for many of our patients. I want to stop there now before we move to epidemiology and see if there are any questions. Okay. If not, I'll keep going. So um, this is the fun part of the talk because this is what I feel like I am expert in just overall and generally is thinking about kind of the bigger picture of cancer in the United States and globally. 
So I'm going to focus um, for this talk in the United States, given that this is um, really most of our research is focused here at Stanford um, within our patient populations in our clinic and elsewhere in the United States. Um, but uh, would be happy to talk offline with anyone that may be interested in the global aspects of cancer, which are um, pretty different, but also have some, some very similar issues that you will hear in this talk. Um, we expect about 2 million new cases of cancer. So um, sadly, cancer continues to affect many of us. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about the risk factors later, but the top four cancers for men include prostate cancer, lung, and colon. And the top cancers for females is uh, breast cancer, lung cancer, and colon cancer. Um, you know, most of this incidence is usually related to the fact that we can screen for those cancers. We can't really screen for a lot of the other cancers. We can somewhat screen for melanoma. Um, but for example, we don't routinely screen for kidney cancer. We don't routinely screen for oropharyngeal cancers. And we certainly still have not begun any screening mechanism for pancreatic cancer. So the epidemiology is somewhat skewed by the fact that we can detect these cancers and are actively screening for them. Um, but overall, we know that even those cancers that we don't screen for seem to be about in the 4% range. Sadly, cancer represents about 25% of all deaths in the United States. And this number, given the fact that we've just lost a million lives to COVID, um, seems trivial. Although for me, even one death is a big concern. So seeing that we are still having issues with cancer-related deaths in the United States is concerning. It means that while we've made such big advancements and great advancements in care, still we have so many individuals that are, um, that are dying. And um, I think I see for Donna, yes, I will talk about that in just a moment um, when we get to screening. So I'll hold that thought and come back to it when we get to screening. If I forget to uh, bring it up, please. Um, raise your hand and then I'll, I'll make sure I mention that in the screening piece, but that's a very good point. She asked about COVID and the issues with screening with COVID, which are huge. Um, so, you know, sadly, it, it does represent a quarter of all deaths in the United States and lung cancer seems sadly to be the, the number one cause of cancer death. Although I did hear that some of the other cancers are circulating to the top as our advancements in lung cancer are getting better and better, um, which is good for me, but not good overall. Um, colon cancer also represents a high proportion of individuals who are dying. And, you know, it is sad because these are the cancers that we have screening for. So what's happening? And so I think this is where Donna's question comes in as well, which we'll talk about when we get to screening. Um, this is an area that, again, I'm going to focus the last part of the talk on, um, but really looking in a primer for you all to think about this as we go through the next couple of slides is the disproportionate death rates by race and ethnicity. So across males and females, individuals that identify as African-American or black have the highest cancer death rates by race and ethnicity despite having a lower incidence. So it's an incidence death paradox. Food for thought. I hope that by the end of the talk, you'll know why. Our American Indian and Alaska Native populations also have high rates of death. And our Hispanic Latinx populations don't have as high rates of death, but what we've done in our own work is found some issues with the denominator. So many individuals who are uh, perhaps have no documentation status oftentimes are not as registered. Our California Cancer Registry, which is a mandated registry for every patient with cancer in the state of California, captures many of these individuals, but not necessarily documentation status many individuals return home. So what we found is that when patients are diagnosed in our work in Monterey County, many individuals decide to return home and therefore their denominator is not captured with the incidences. So it could be potentially paradoxical, but we've also done research looking at what's called the Hispanic paradox. And we have some interesting findings that I'll share in a bit regarding what potentially may be leading to um, some of the differential deaths in this population. So, um, I hate to be kind of grim and grum, but it is true. The, the older we get, sooner or later we'll all get cancer. Our body is meant to adapt. You know, we have evolutionary changes with our cells. We're constantly evolving. And so, you know, this unproliferated growth is 
is part of evolution. It's part of just how our bodies are meant to work. And sadly, sometimes that proliferation of cells turns into these unrapid, rapid, uncontrolled growth. So many of us can get cysts and benign tumors because that's just what our body does. But the older we get, um, the longer we're exposed to many of the risk factors that are below age, um, the more likely we are to get cancer. So I would be surprised if I had met a hundred year old individual that had no skin cancer, had never had a cancer diagnosis, um, you know, even as, as small as a basal cell carcinoma that was treated, certainly that's part of our cancer continuum. So um, it is true that just age is a, a, a big risk factor. And so that's why we see the age skewing towards the older populations. Um, men are more susceptible to women, although that is changing. Um, for a long time, we thought that lung cancer was a disease amongst males, but now we're realizing that there are environmental factors that are contributing to that. So we're now beginning to see a shift, sadly, in um, women catching up. Um, we do know that our environment plays a role. I'm not sure how many of you all were in California during the fires. I was, and I breathed that air. And many of us know that pollution does cause changes intrinsically in our lung tissue, and that leads to cancer being developed, as well as um, uncontrolled growth and evolution in our lung cells. Um, hormone exposure as well is a big piece. UV radiation. Anytime we go outside, you know, we're at risk for uh, developing cancer due to skin cancer. So that's why we've got preventive measures such as sunscreen, hats, and avoidance. Ionizing radiation, which we know um, really does cause an issue in terms of most of the blood cancers that we see. Chemical exposure. So individuals living in Monterey and working in migrant farm worker fields, which was um, the, the way that I came into oncology was as a medical student at UNC, um, we had a very high migrant farm worker population and seeing individuals at an unbeknownst rate, although it was anecdotal, coming in with a very advanced uh, acute leukemia. Um, while it's very hard to make the linkage, we do know that some pesticides are clearly banned, um, but others and routine exposure to chemical exposure, such as pesticides, continues to lead to unprolific growth and changes that um, are due to occupational hazards, but also the individuals living there. I'm not sure if any of you all have been to Monterey County, but the school systems, there was a large um, effort in the schools to try to sound an alarm when they were spraying pesticides on the um, strawberries in the fields. Behaviors. So um, I'm gonna hope that we shift this conversation as we go through in terms of these behaviors because they're not really clearly linked to individuals. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll understand why I'm saying this. But we do know that tobacco smoking, alcohol use, diet, our ability to exercise, obesity and infections are very much linked to um, many cancers. Globally, a third of cancers are preventable. In the United States, a larger proportion are preventable. So now I'm gonna to go to cancer screening. So I love these. These are um, American Cancer Society when there was a big push to awareness. I think awareness is the first aspect of overcoming disparities in care and also overcoming um, some issues regarding cancer, but also public health messaging as we've all now experienced with COVID-19. Um, but I'm gonna argue that cancer screening really began back in the 18th century. So in the lectures on germs and vestiges of disease, that's when we became acutely aware of the hygiene hypothesis and the prevention of illness. And so that kind of led to the foundation of what cancer screening is and um, the, the principles of cancer screening. In the 1920s, um, that's when the first periodic health exam for early disease detection was conducted and the first pap smear. So that was our first at least recorded documentation of what we would consider cancer screening in the current stage. 
Um, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, those campaigns that I showed in the prior slide were led by this American Society for the Control of Cancer, which is now the American Cancer Society. And their whole goal was to really begin to develop ways to um, make individuals and populations aware of cancer and what they can do to potentially avoid and avert um, undiagnosed cancers. In the 60s is when we um, began to see principles and practices from the WHO, so a global effort for screening for disease. And in the 70s is when um, Doug Owens, who's here and was chair of the USPSTF, is the Un United States um, Preventative Services Task Force, and a similar task force in Canada, as well as other nations, was developed, um, which is an independent volunteer panel of experts that really work to try to make recommendations about clinical preventive services. There is a linkage um, of what comes out of these individual recommendations and payment and reimbursement. So they really are, and their recommendations really do um, make a difference in terms of what is provided in terms of reimbursement and what is also part of our policy efforts for inclusion, for example, on the um, ACA, the Affordable Care Act. Prior to 1980, we started seeing that breast cancer was beginning to be screened for. Cervical cancer, which again, it kind of begun in the 20s, was really established in the early 80s, and then colon cancer. And in the early 90s, um, prostate cancer began to be screened for. And in 2013, lung cancer, um, quite a long time before our United States uh, made um, definitive arguments that lung cancer that was tobacco related. So our policies make a difference in terms of how we are able to provide care. And the fact that we can utilize uh, CT scans, there was a large um, kind of conflicting body of evidence regarding lung cancer screening and the harms of CT scans versus x-rays. That's a whole different talk that I give in a different class. But um, if you're interested, I have a slide on um, the radiation exposure that you get from flying in an airplane transcontinentally versus the radiation exposure that you get from a low dose CT scan. Um, but recent data has led to lung cancer now being screened for. So the important aspect of screening is that you're not screening before, although we're now moving into that with the genomic screening. Um, usually and traditionally screening begins after you've begun to develop the disease and it's detectable by a test. There's a critical point where you want to be able to detect it prior to signs or symptoms developing or before it has extended and expanded or metastasized to the point where you have no treatment options or available. So it's the point in the natural history before which the therapy is most effective so that then you have a series of choices for which you can begin to intervene upon. Now, as I mentioned, USPSTF is really sentinel in terms of our treatment and our screening processes. Women with breast cancer now, it's, and it's constantly in flux. So this just happened a couple of years ago where women ages 40 to 44 now have a choice. And so it's reimbursed now by um, the ACA as well as by other insurance. Um, usually most insurance rely on ACA, but um, there's always a, an aspect of women, if they want to be able to have a choice for being able to be screened by mammogram at the age of 40. And then again, 45 to 54 yearly, and then from 55 to 74 biannually, so every other year, although that is up for debate um, if you were to ask some of our breast cancer specialists at Stanford. Cervical cancer um, you know, has also changed because we now know the linkage between HPV. So we do a cervical cytology screen every three years, and then again, it fluctuates after um, the three years. Uh, usually for women, again, this is just always in flux, is looking at HPV testing. I know some communities are beginning to test HPV much earlier. Um, and then if you combine them, you can now extend it to every five years. Whereas when I was growing up, uh, you know, we had to undergo cervical cancer screening every, every year. So this is a dramatic improvement with our technology. Colorectal cancer, sadly, I gotta get my colonoscopy now that this um, recommendation has been made. It used to always be age 50 and now it's changed to 45. I think Donna's probably happy about that since she was working in the GI clinic and seeing a lot of individuals that were younger um, coming in with colon cancer. 
So um, we still tend to like colonoscopies better than FOBT, which is the um, occult blood testing through stool-based testing. However, um, the USPSTF has made multiple options available. And then lung cancer just changed recommendations. So it used to be 55 to 80, um, 55 to 80 with a 30 pack year history who had quit within the past 10 years. And because we know there are disparities inherent in the way that we set up the screening recommendations, um, we found that individuals who are black African-American tend to be younger when they are diagnosed with cancer and they tend to have lower pack year history of smoking and they tend to have had stopped smoking for much longer. So by that recommendation, we were increasing disparities. So that has now changed. And then the great prostate cancer. So in 1992, there was recommendation with every man getting PSAs. And then there was a recent shift again, what happens when we make these shifts without thinking about the implication of who's getting diagnosed with cancer is really concerning because a lot of black men have cancer, prostate cancer, and are being diagnosed at later stages. But yet now we've got this controversial discussion about the benefit of PSA screening. And so this one is kind of you hedge. Do you have a preference? If you have a preference, great, you screen. If you don't have a preference, then we don't necessarily need to screen. And I want you to hold on to that point when I come to the uh, next couple of slides regarding disparities in screening. So um, men ages 70 and older, they believe firmly that prostate cancer is something you'll die with and not something you die from. And at that point, probably there's no data Again, it's a recommendation D, but you know, very little data to recommend screening. So to answer um, Donna's point, uh, cancer screening really did take a hit. And what we've seen in the literature is that most individuals um, that were disproportionately impacted by COVID, which are black communities and African, black, black communities and our Latinx communities, had lower rates of screening during that time. We did a large study at the beginning of the pandemic. I had just had a baby, so I was on maternity leave, but um, you know, came in and off of maternity leave to volunteer in our clinics and to also volunteer in the ER, um, just because that's my calling, right? I'm a doctor and we're in a pandemic and you just do what you need for, for your country and for your people. Um, so I came in and was just dramatically upset by the decisions that were made, made, being made to, to withhold treatment for certain individuals. So there wasn't really any guideline, you know, we just shut down all of a sudden. And then certain people were getting into the telehealth visits and certain people want, weren't. And people that were calling and had the ability to advocate for themselves were the, inevitably the ones that were getting their appointments scheduled and their treatment scheduled. And so it led me to think about um, our practice during COVID-19 and if Black individuals and Latinx individuals and, and dis disparate individuals that we know already had less access to our system were potentially experiencing worse cancer delays. And so we've just finished a, a pretty intensive analysis looking at 1,240 individuals across the United States during the early period of the pandemic from uh, the first year of the pandemic. And it was a patient reported outcome survey. So we got all 50 states, we had, um, community groups involved to help us to obtain uh, responses. We sent it out widely through our national organization and patient advocacy groups, as well as we partnered with clinics. And we also got five territories um, worth of, of data as well of patients in, the, in five different territories, mostly from Puerto Rico, where they just had a, you know, an experience an earthquake. So it was um, disaster upon disaster in that particular area. And what we found sadly, was that um, the delays were much more extensive amongst Black uh, individuals in the United States and Latinx individuals, despite having the same clinical characteristics. So uh, most individuals you know, did have access to internet, had access to treatment options, were already undergoing treatment. So why would there be such a, a large disparity? It was almost eightfold. So that should be published in the next couple of months. But, um, what we're seeing now with screening is that 
we saw similar aspects of where now screening has returned back to baseline, but not for all populations. So it makes us take our hat off and think about, I don't wanna go back to the same structure. We already know that there were disparities in screening to begin with. So now is an opportunity for us to really redesign and reimagine the way that we help to overcome inequities. And so I'm gonna go through the next couple of slides and, and, and touch on this. I see another question in the chat about um, why does cancer spread? That's a good question. It wants to spread. So um, Jessica, I mean, it's hard to know why it does, but it usually, you know, will will stay in its micro environment as long as it can. But most cancers really do like and break off, right? Pieces of it. If you've got a big mountain of sand and you keep adding more and more sand onto it, eventually you're going to see pieces of sand break off just because it's gotten too big. So um, it's usually equated to size. So as the tumor gets bigger, it begins to spread. But we've also seen and been shocked by some of these tumors that are quite small that have spread to other places that we wouldn't imagine. So for example, um, for patients with early stage lung cancer, even early stage colon cancer, you do a large CT scan to evaluate where else it may be. And you found that the cancer has already gone through the blood or the lymph node system to the lung. And that was why I chose that particular um, picture to represent that. Um, others, it's slow and some it's fast. So again, it depends on, that's why genomically testing the tumors is really important. But with every aspect of what we do in terms of progress in cancer, we inadvertently increase disparities and inequities. Every time we make a dramatic improvement at Stanford, inadvertently, CyberKnife, for example, is not available for my patients that are in Stockton. So I'm lucky, I work at the VA, there's a mission act, right? They can see anybody they want out in the community. Not everybody has access to the Stanford and the Stanford is five hours from many of these people. Yesterday, my patient drove five and a half hours to see me. And I highly recommended that he go to Stanford for his radiation because he would have cyber knife that would cause less side effects. It would be available in one day. It would only be 15 minutes for him to get the treatment versus elsewhere where we've seen the outcomes are not as good. And luckily he has VA access. And luckily he came into my clinic and luckily he you know, utilized the VA insurance. What happens to individuals that are in Stockton or like my parents who were diagnosed with cancer, misdiagnosed with cancer multiple times, they live in a very small area in Shelby, North Carolina. It's the home of the KKK annual convention. They don't have access to breast surgeons. They don't have, they have access to a general surgeon, you know, that sees tons of people. And I have the greatest admiration for general surgeons in the small community. They are the pillar of access. But my mom's outcomes were different because of where she lived and where she got her treatment. And luckily she had three children who my parents aren't in any way involved in medicine. They are textile designers and um, immigrants. And you know, English is a second language for us growing up. My sister paved the way for us to get into medical school. She was the first and um, really kind of paved the pathway. And I knew that I was interested in medicine, but certainly we didn't have the resources growing up such that I would have access to good schools. In our schools, we got spit at because we were different. We weren't black or white. And it was really hard to imagine how to break out of such a system and really begin to think about education. But luckily because of my tumors microenvironment, my microenvironment in my home, which not everybody has, my parents were able to instill in us educational value and were able to help us to figure out school systems that we could go to, for example, that were state-based. It required us leaving our homes. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a moment, but not everyone has that same access. And those structures then determine the access and the ability of individuals to even access healthcare. And the linkage is so intrinsic that Without addressing these upstream factors, we won't ever be able to address disparities. So we take a step back because that was a lot um, and then begin to explain what I just said. So for years and decades, we've been talking about disparities. It's just a difference, right? Like, okay, there are differences by race, ethnicity. I showed you that first slide at the beginning of the talk about um, 
Black, African American, United States populations versus white populations in the United States, they just have different rates of mortality. It's just a difference. You know, there's a difference in incidence and prevalence and mortality and burden. It's just a description. There's differences and we don't know what caused it. So here's more evidence of differences. Latinx populations have twice the incidence rate of cervical cancer than white females. Black Americans have twice the rate of prostate cancer mortality. And again, remember the screening issue. If you can screen for a cancer and detect it early, why is the mortality so much higher? I want you to think about that as we go through these, because look, most of the three on the slide, and I didn't bring in breast cancer, but similar, higher rates of a detectable cancer at an earlier stage, yet higher rates of death. Liver and stomach cancer, which we don't um, routinely, we don't have really any screening mechanism for this. It's usually related to HCC and other um, aspects of diet. And lung cancer deaths. And these differences are not just by race and ethnicity, and I focused on that. Sorry, there should be an and and on a slash. Now we, um, the terminology is race and ethnicity because they are very different. Um, geographic location, I described what happened to my mom and my dad, your sexual orientation and gender identity, higher rates of cancer within those populations, uh, more mortality, socioeconomic status, age, disability, and your national origin. And sadly, these disparities and differences, I'm just gonna call them differences, they exist prevention, they exist when we detect cancer, they exist when we diagnose cancer, they exist in treatment, they exist in survivorship, and they exist at the end of life, which is where most of my research has been is at the end of life and also upstream in the detection and diagnosis phase. Why do we have differences? So I'm gonna throw this out to you all. We've, you all have been so quiet. Um, you know, throw out some ideas of, you know, we talked about patient characteristics, some biological factors. Can folks throw out in the chat or, um, just just describe some of the differences that you think may be causing some of these disparities. And please feel free to unmute as well. We, we would love to have participation. As uh, Dr. Patel said, you have all been so quiet. Please unmute and pitch in. So uh, Catherine says access to care and financial in the chats. Yes. So you all are already kind of moving upstream. You know, what's interesting is the etiologies for disparities have always been linked to patient characteristics or genetics. But, you know, I have a mom with cancer. And so then I just automatically in my DNA have cancer that's going to predispose me to, to um, or have genes that are going to predispose me. But I love Asha's as well as Catherine's because we're moving now from thinking about what's on the left-hand side of the screen that focuses on individuals to thinking about the right-hand side of the screen that focuses on systems. And the reason this is important is because our work in cancer has always gone towards the blame on the individuals. Where we look at clinical characteristics or individual race and ethnicity, which is a social construct becomes a characteristic that then somehow is linked to Black Americans somehow have a predisposition to certain cancers. Now, while there may be some genetic linkage that may be true, the overwhelming reason for disparities, as I mentioned, with 80% being preventable, is due to what's on the right hand side of the screen. I'm just going to read out the, sorry, I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt. I'm just oh, going to no. read out the um, chats. Um, they say, uh, of course, you mentioned Asha, uh, insurance structures and redlining districts and area access. And then uh, another one says uh, cultural backgrounds and dis disrupt uh, 
the distrust of health systems provide and providers, and then fear of the healthcare system and reluctance to seek out screening and treatment for cancer. These are wonderful. And I'm gonna to touch on all of these. I also want to maybe change the paradigm of this whole trust issue. And I always look at what we do from a systems perspective of what do we do at Stanford to engender trust? Rather than again, thinking about individuals having mistrust in us, what are we doing to make people trust us? That's on us. And so it's a slight difference in terms of looking at it again from the lens of we can't blame people. And I know that this wasn't in your comments, but I always talk to students about this. When it comes, when trust comes up, it's difficult because it seems like that's my, an inherent issue with me not trusting the system. Whereas I'm trying to challenge systems in every talk I give to think about what they're doing we did a large survey study looking at people where they go for cancer care in the Bay Area. And we focused in Alameda um, County. We never wrote it up, but now I'm thinking we probably should have. This was about 10, 15, no, right when I came to Stanford, so almost 20 years ago, um, where it was really interesting to me that where people seek care is not necessarily in their neighborhood. So everyone thinks that, okay, most people think, that I'm gonna to go to the cancer center that's closest to me and that's where I'm gonna go for care. But rather individuals in Alameda County were bypassing these NCI designated cancer centers, which are supposed to be expert in the top of the world like ours, to go to a cancer center or a cancer clinic that's 45 minutes away because they trusted that clinic and that clinic had engendered trust more so than our NCI designated cancer center. So. And it's a hard pill to swallow for me to think about, you know, I do work in a very different system where veterans for the most part want to come and seek care at the VA because of the other services that are available. But with the Mission Act, which was an act that allowed veterans to seek care outside, what we've started to see over time is this lapse in outcomes because the VA is such an integrated system with great cancer care resources that usually are so a, a par and better than most of our NCI designated cancer centers for people that may have socioeconomic status, um, um, you know, factors that may lead to worse outcomes really does a better job for that patient population. And so I really want us to walk away thinking about what can all of us do to change our research practices at Stanford and how we conduct research and how we conduct our clinical processes such that we make it easier for patients to trust in us. You know, I think the environmental factors are really important and someone brought up redlining. Um, you know, I call it white roads through black neighborhoods, hugely important. Social factors that we've talked about as well, income, insurance, access, these clinical factors, the quality of healthcare. And I'm gonna unhighlight some of these behavioral factors because I have a slide about why I think we need to change the paradigm in these behavioral factors. Now, again, this is my view and I'm not sure if it's a representative, it's a little bit out of the mark of the traditional way of thinking about these things, but I hope it does cause some food for thought and makes you think about this. So I think that poverty, which we know in this nation, the night of the launch to the moon, which was triumphant. The People's Poverty Campaign launched a protest because we were sending people and had decided as a nation to send people to the moon, and we still are. SpaceX, we're sending people to the moon. And we still have not addressed the fundamental issue for health disparities and health inequity in the United States, which is poverty. Dr. Payne responded to the campaign and said, the reason we're sending people to the moon is because it's easier than fixing poverty. For me, it's a health issue, public health issue, hands down. I bet if we drew a map of COVID, it would probably link very closely. 
If you look at this map of the places that have the highest poverty rates, guess what? They have the highest death rates in cancer. Is that genetic? Hmm, I don't think so. Environmental factors are key, important. Um, Scarlett Gomez, who's up at UCSF, we lost the opportunity to get her down at Stanford. She's a wonderful epidemiologist, has done tons of work her entire life on looking at these neighborhood factors and the built environment. And the slide above shows pollution, right? If you think about, if you do have white roads through black neighborhoods, which primarily, if you go on 101, you see where 101 goes through. And you're constantly inhaling that pollution. And then, then you look at the practices of redlining, which we brought up, and you see that some of these forces were out of people's controls to choose to live in particular neighborhoods. And then what we did with those neighborhoods, the Urban Renewal Act, really does lead to more outcomes. I brought up the issues of workplace hazards, which many of us know that with COVID, hate to bring up COVID, but I really think I don't even think there's a silver lining, so I don't want to say that. But with COVID, it really showed us, I hope, you know, it's easier now to get these talks than it was 10 years ago. You can ask Donna. I was ousted from fellowship as being this odd person who didn't know what she was talking about and didn't really fit in at Stanford um, for years. But so much easier to give this talk because your slot, your chat just told me that you all are now aware and probably have been aware for a long time. You all are definitely very smart and attuned. But it, the, the rest of the world was never talking about some of these structural issues that lead to disparities. And in COVID-19, we see a disproportionate individual groups that were required to come to work. Black and brown communities were more likely to work in occupations that required in-person work. In the VA, the majority of the individuals that were cleaning our clinic rooms were non-white. And they, just like me, were coming to work. We had lack of PPE. We were given one mask a day. For me that has a half day clinic, that's okay. I guess. Our janitorial and custodial staff were there eight hours, forced to clean places within our clinics that were ridden with COVID, which we now all know is airborne, although I don't think I've seen CDC report like that. Inhaling COVID and disproportionately being affected by COVID. Many did not have a choice and still don't have a choice in terms of what their occupation is. When we think about cancer, we think about our migrant farm workers who are coming in, but guess what? Our data doesn't really demonstrate the death rates. So are we really addressing the workplace and occupational hazards for individuals who are typically in those occupations who may have lower socioeconomic status and who may have other factors that somehow just intrinsically be, seems to be linked to their race and ethnicity? I'm so lucky that I can go outside and run in Palo Alto and I don't have to fear for, um, you know, when I first came to, to California, I, we had so many predators in, in North Carolina and these were male predators that would wait in um, parks for young women joggers to run by and would sexually assault them as they're running midday. And so it was always fearful. I was an avid runner and have been um, to run alone in midday. So even in my small neighborhood, when we had grown up, my parents would, we would have to drive. So we were lucky, we had a car, we had no street lights. The neighbors all had rabid dogs or you know, very aggressive dogs that they would leave out um, and that would come and you know bark. That was more of a protection mechanism, but there was no fence and electric fence to protect. So you just didn't walk around the neighborhood ever. And if you were seen walking around the neighborhood, you know that was kind of crazy and untraditional. And so when I came to California, I asked um, Tamara Dunn, who many of you know um, on the, or may know, um, she's the, one of the chairs for diversity and equity at Stanford um, in the Department of Medicine. 
And I asked her, I said, you know, she'd been in California before. And I said, you know, is it, is it safe for me to run? And they said, oh yeah, but you need to watch out for the predators. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I would never run, you know, alone. And they and I said, because I don't definitely don't know the area and I'm not sure about, um, you know, people and how the, the crime rates out here. And they looked at me as if I was crazy. And they said, what are you talking about? We're talking about mountain lions. Don't run at dusk because there are mountain lions and coyotes over there by the dish. Not everyone has that privilege. We have farmer's markets. I love our bike lanes. Not everyone has the same access to being able to be physically fit. So that whole concept of physical inactivity and obesity, I have to drive really far to get to a Walmart here. But yet I have lots of different options of more expensive produce, probably three Whole Foods on the way to get to the Walmart. In North Carolina, you've got a Walmart almost on every corner. We are really privileged that we can make decisions and make choices that aren't built into the structures that are around us. And it makes it easier to choose those healthy options such that we aren't obese, we aren't physically inactive, we aren't bombarded with alcohol, we aren't bombarded, bombarded with smoking. We have rules and policies in California with everything going on in the world that protect us and put public health number one. As unpopular as it was to have mask mandates in the Bay Area, we had a view and an outside lens of what our personal actions and how our personal actions contribute to the disproportionate death and devastation amongst our communities in the Bay Area. Now, not all neighborhoods, just because of where they are located, tend to have worse outcomes. And what we showed in a study early in my fellowship was that there are some certain aspects of social support, and that has led to a whole area of research in my group focused on trying to help individuals when we can't necessarily change the structures of where they're living. Perhaps we can build in and embed from the health system these networks of social support that are trusted and have engendered trust by individuals such that their outcomes are better. And what we showed in this one study was an, it was an observational study before I even knew that I'd be in this um, line of research, was that individuals uh, living in these areas within California that have what's called high enclavity. So these are immigrant individuals from mostly from Mexico. They tend to, when my parents also came to the United States, they tended to flock to Philadelphia because there were lots of people that spoke their same language. They didn't speak English. My dad didn't speak English, had to go through college and had to learn English when he came here. And so what he did was he went to an area where he knew there would be tons of people that spoke Gujarati so that he could navigate his way around the community. 10 cents in his pocket, you know, ostracized from his family and somehow was able to get um, funds to come, uh, you know, with a flight. But they, you tend to, to migrate to places where you know you're going to have the social support that can help you. And then oftentimes you end up living there and staying there unless you have work that may take you elsewhere or other opportunities. And so in these communities, we saw that there was high rates of, a high proportion of individuals that speak Spanish, very low proportion of individuals that speak English, very high levels of um, newly immigrated patient populations who tend to have worse cancer outcomes. But yet when we looked at these enclaves, they seem to have better survival and better outcomes. Could it be the individuals in these communities are creating a community unified effort to overcome these structural barriers that are in place in the neighborhoods, such that they're able to tell people, look, Stanford is down South, UCSF is up here. You need to go there if you have lung cancer. You don't need to go to that clinic that we all go to that's, you know, in the mission that has no cancer doctor. This is where you need to go. I don't know. It's hard to know because this is such a large analysis, but it, we're finding aspects of that currently in my research. So I talked about this high school that I went to, and I want to take a step back and think about tobacco smoking because this is also a paradigm shift. You know, the, the top 10 core populations in the United States that are disproportionately affected by cigarette smoking 
I don't think is due to personal choice necessarily. Yes, there's some aspect of personal choice, but I wanna take the VA and the veteran example as a way to start thinking about this paradigm shift. So in the VA, our service workers um, were given as part of their commissary packs, cigarettes at a very young age. Many had enlisted in the service and had been in the service from ages 18 onward. They were told that they needed to stay alert. Nicotine keeps you alert during combat. And they were given loads and loads of cigarettes. They would stain from alcohol because alcohol makes you sleepy, but certainly there was this unbeknownst pressure, not only from what we were doing in terms of trying to make better individuals more alert for combat, but also the social aspect of taking a smoke break during the service. Stress relief. But if you're given that in your commissary and you're given those as part of what you're supposed to do, how now are we blaming individuals for choosing to smoke? In North Carolina, we grew up on a tobacco farm. You were paid with tobacco. My high school. So I mentioned I grew up in a very small area in North Carolina and the school systems were horrible. Um, you know, but I did have access to education and public education and very thankful for that. Um, so in 10th grade, my, when my sister was in 10th grade, she found out about this school of this North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, which was their earliest school in the United States that was fully taxpayer based. It's almost like a magnet school, but it's residential and the, they are professors that um, are trained at Duke, who actually have joint appointments at Duke. It's um, right on Duke's campus. So it's a walking distance from Duke's East campus. And you apply, you take the SAT in 10th grade, and then you they have quotas for where you get in. And so I luckily happened, my sister luckily happened to get in because no one else from our county was ever applying for the school. And so we met the quota, um, you know, despite my SAT scores being really horrific. And our school was funded because it was taxpayer dollars by RJ Reynolds, which was a large tobacco company. I don't know how many of you know Christina Koch. So her, her actual name is Christina Hammock. When I knew her, she was in my class and in, um, in high school and she was an astronaut. She's our astronaut that just came back from space I believe, last year or year before. And it was a big deal for us, but you know, you're in the basketball court and you're allowed to smoke, but we're underage, but we're allowed to smoke on campus because we were funded by RJ Reynolds. So even though it was illegal to purchase cigarettes, if you happen to have cigarettes, the policies in place because of the funding structures allowed us to smoke on campus. Now I never picked up a cigarette, but these are individuals that started Google, right? Like, you know, quit, um, didn't go to college, which was a detriment to, United, to North Carolina because they were hoping for college bound individuals, but who came out to the Silicon Valley and um, started the internet. Um, so very, very smart individuals. And the majority of people in my high school smoked because it was allowed and it was social and it was a stress for me. And because it was somewhat promoted. I love the School of Science and Math. I think it's because of the School of Science and Math I am where I am. But you can't avoid the policies that are in place or not in place that lead to promotion of particular behaviors. So taking a step back, it's a multi-level problem. Disparities, inequity is multi-level. And I've just described how societal level policies in terms of funding and national policies and state level policies really do make a difference. Our communities make a difference. Our payers also contribute. Our Stanford healthcare system, as I've talked briefly about, I'm going to go now into the healthcare system and what we can do. So going from the macro level now down to the micro level of what we can do here at Stanford and what you can do in your research and the practice. 
So I talked about disparities in screening. Why is it that we see higher rates of certain cancers that are curable and detectable, but yet lead to worse outcomes? And I showed you all those slides looking at um, disparate mortality rates. We know that there are disparities, differences, inequity in screening rates. And that sadly has continued during COVID and has gotten worse. So for mammograms, if you identify as being in poverty, you have much lower rates of screening. Now this was in 2005, ACA, the Affordable Care Act, again, showing you how policies change this. In states where there has been a mandate to equalize and make screening equitable and covered by the Affordable Care Act, we have seen these disparities go away in screening. Macro policy makes a difference. But yeah, not every state has that. And even within those states, there are still differences because of the issues that we talked about regarding structures. But across all of the screening tests, this seems to be the same story. So maybe there's something going on, right? It's not just about some people not wanting to come in to get pap smears. It's not just about people not wanting to come in to get mammograms. It's the fact that it's the same picture across everything that we can screen for. It's the same exact graph, right? So there's also disparities in receipt of what I do in my clinic. There are race-based and again, socioeconomic status-based disparities in whether I screen patients for if they use tobacco, which then leads to whether or not I advise them to quit smoking. If I don't screen them for tobacco use, I'm not going to advise them to quit smoking. And I'm certainly not going to provide tobacco cessation treatments in the first year or in the year past year. And what we've also shown is that despite what insurance you have. Yes, it's a contributor, but despite what insurance you have, people from particular racial and ethnic backgrounds inevitably are not receiving the care for cancer, evidence-based care for cancer. So you look at Medicaid, which we know has inherent fraud with structural issues. But what about private insurance? Why for our privately insured Black and Hispanic Latinx patient populations, do we see this huge gap in evidence-based care? I don't understand what's happening. Actually, I do, or I think I do. But this slide really just clearly shows insurance is one piece of it. Yeah, your rates may go up, but really there are differences even within these insurance buckets that make you think about what we're doing. So my research over the past decade, decade and a half, has really looked at the fact that, you know, again, where you go and variations in clinics determines what kind of care you get. So in Kaiser, for example, everyone gets their lymph nodes examined. So if you have a colon cancer, you're supposed to examine the lymph nodes in the specimen, and you're supposed to, someone came up with the idea of 12 lymph nodes. I'm not sure. It seems arbitrary to me. But the pathologist is supposed to look under a microscope and get and find 12 lymph nodes, which means the surgeon was supposed to cut out enough tissue where there's 12 lymph nodes that are identifiable. If you examine those lymph nodes and one of them is positive, you're supposed to get chemotherapy. So if you only examine six and none of those six were positive, but perhaps one of the six that you didn't examine were positive, that person didn't get chemotherapy because they were told zero out of six nodes are positive. In Kaiser and more integrated systems, everybody was getting 12 lymph nodes examined. It was a quality metric. You had to do this. So there were no disparities in terms of who was getting those 12 lymph nodes examined. So what do you think happened to the colon cancer outcomes for people with stage three disease? Any guess? Do you think there were disparities or not? No disparities. Because everybody got the same treatment. 
there was a concerted effort to make sure that people who came to surgical resection got that 12 lymph nodes examined, which is hard. It is hard. It's hard to make sure you have specimen and it's also hard to dig through omentum and look for these lymph nodes, but they did it. Outside of Kaiser, stark disparities. People that got the lymph nodes resected, uh, examined did better, of course, and people that didn't get the lymph node examined did worse. And it seemed to be clustered in where you go for your care. We've looked at the VA where we've seen similar issues. I talked about the VA. They um, are really just a dramatic example and there are lots of issues in the VA, of course, but the VA really does um, take care of veterans and knows all of the social issues. So we have housing for individuals that need, need cancer treatment. They, we have buses that can get patients so that they aren't driving five hours. Um, yes, there are problems with transportation, but it's still set up. And we've got behavioral medicine that's integrated in our clinic. I've never seen that at Stanford, where we have a behavioral specialist that's in our clinic doing distress screening for our patients, following up with mental health. So it really is a nice comprehensive system where there's a lot of resources because we know the veteran population is so um, disproportionately advantage, disadvantaged in certain ways and many of our social factors and social structures that can contribute to health inequities. And what we found was that, you know, after chemotherapy, there's a really high rate of hospitalizations. And most of this is avoidable. And Donna was on a study with me looking at Stanford of this call system that we had, of people calling into Stanford and, um, you know, it was a reactive system. And so it led for us trying to think about ways to proactively identify symptoms so that people are not, when they would call in, Inevitably, they get referred to the ER because they're calling about symptoms. But if you look over how many times they had called Stanford, this individual, you know, many individuals have called Stanford three to four times about the same symptom over a period of a week. And then it just got to the point where it had not been intervened upon for those three or four days, such that then they ended up in the ER. And so perhaps we could do some proactive management. And so in the VA, there's not really that proactive management, but there is something inherently different about avoiding these hospitalizations after chemotherapy. And there's differences when these vets would use the Mission Act and go outside of our system versus when they were within our system. We could avoid hospitalizations by getting them in for infusion. We follow up, we had access, they didn't have to go through the whole rigmarole of looking for copay payment payments and could actually get access to our clinic. So this was national data, not just at the VA Palo Alto. Um, I wish that Stanford and other places were open to everybody. I wish the Kaisers of the world were open to everybody. But that road is often closed for certain people. This was, you know, again, I think we talked about structural racism and how it's embedded in redlining, then that leads to you leave, living in particular neighborhoods, then that leads to you being diagnosed or maybe not diagnosed early with cancer because you're probably not gonna get screened. Then that leads to you coming in with a cancer diagnosis but not getting the treatment. Are you all following? We've now come full circle to the end where in the healthcare system, we have a modifiable way of making sure that our patients get equitable treatment, even if we're reaching them so downstream. How can we ensure and make sure that once patients get into our door, we don't worsen the disparities, that everyone can have access to the cyber knives and that we are making concerted effort and we may have to do that more so for our black and Hispanic patient populations to get them in and to have adherence to treatment and to ensure that we're not creating structures where when we switch to telemedicine, people without access to telemedicine aren't going to be able to get their care. We saw early in the pandemic in July, high disproportionate death rates and hospitalizations amongst Black and Latinx populations in a virus that doesn't seem, yes, there may be some genetic orientation, but doesn't at this point seem to be highly dependent on your underlying genetics. And sadly, we're seeing after George Floyd, continued racism in this nation that then portends into disparities in terms of hospitalizations, cases of COVID, deaths, 
and this is COVID because we have easy data. It's a, it's a, you, you can track the virus, you can track when people die pretty quickly. For cancer, it's longitudinal. It may take us years to be able to evaluate this. And now we've got years of data showing this in cancer and we have yet to make any big difference. Paul Farmer, I'm not sure how many of you know him. I'm getting towards the end of my talk. I wanna leave room for questions. Was a humanitarian and I read his book when I was in uh, prior to medical school, Mountains Beyond Mountains. He was a professor in Harvard and Brigham and Women's. And really, if you haven't read that book, I would ask that you all do. It was written decades ago. But it was really this concept of health as being a human right. That it's precious. And that everyone should have the opportunity to be as healthy as we are on this phone call and as healthy as, as we deserve to be. And it shouldn't be built on who has access to what. And so he built a series of clinics in Haiti and he, he passed away suddenly this past year. And if you just Google him, um, you know, many people went into medical school because of this intrinsic understanding of wanting to help people. Some people may not, that may be an overgeneralization, but I like to think positively about medical school and research. Many of you all are in research because we have the patient on the other side of those specimen that we're carrying back and forth to the lab. And, you know, I constantly am reminding my team you know, yeah, we do have to mail things out and you're gonna have to lick, you know, envelopes for a while and we'll get students to help and we'll all work together as a team. Even I'm licking envelopes and sending off advanced directives in the mail and making trips to the post office. But there's a patient on the other side of that. And there's a bigger picture of what our research represents here at Stanford. We're so incredibly lucky and so blessed to be here and so incredibly blessed to be working in the field that we are but it's often easy to lose sight of the fact that, especially with the devastation of over a million lives lost, which makes me very emotional as a doctor. It's not okay if we have ways to prevent illness. Choosing health equity is a choice and it is not an easy one. We've seen politicization of policies that protect those that are at most risk of dying from cancer, but it becomes a political debate. Having access to Medicaid expansion, why is that a policy? Why is that a debate? I led a large um, statement prior to George Floyd um, about from our national organization, really pushed our national organization to create this statement on health equity. That it's been 10 years since we, as oncologists and as our national organization in the United States representing 45,000 different individuals all geared towards conquering cancer, have we not looked back and instead of saying disparities and differences, really taken this concept of health equity as being a public right, a fair and just opportunity. It is a right. Healthcare disparities are just differences. But unless we move towards this new definition of what we're going to do about these differences that are due to structural racism and marginalization, we're never going to be able to achieve health for our people globally. And so they took me up and it was hard because there were a lot of barriers and a lot of this is political. Even saying the words back then of structural racism was not accepted in a policy paper that was dedicated to health equity, cancer health equity. I fought tooth and nail to get the words in that paper. and it got watered down to structural discrimination. Again, this was prior to George Floyd. The paper came out after George Floyd. But what it made us think about as a society 
our national society, in terms of our cancer society, is that we really have to begin to address these larger barriers, which are hard and require people like you on the ground thinking about this, when you're thinking about who you're going to enroll in clinical trials, be it cancer or not, what extra steps are you going to take to make sure that someone that's enrolled in a clinical trial is still getting the access that they want, right? Or that you're carrying specimen. How can we diversify our clinical trials such that they're equitable as well? So over the past 12 days, um, I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble, as I always do. Our national meeting has 45,000 people in attendance globally. And the meeting is mask optional. So it bothered me. And I've been silent for a long time watching this happen and watching the devastation as a doctor sitting and doing my research in equity, proudly wearing my mask to represent the fact that I don't want to contribute to further ongoing harm, especially knowing the inequity that my actions may eventually cause. Not everyone takes a, a hard look at their own actions. But masking is one strategy that we can all do despite the policies, knowing that our individual actions are going to protect other people. And yes, vaccinations are important, but guess what? In January and February of this year, 42% of the people that died from COVID were vaccinated. The majority of the people that are dying from COVID, now it's shifting, have predominantly been amongst our black and brown communities but now they're affecting all of us. Multiple healthcare workers, including individuals in my own division, are out with COVID, further disrupting the system of being able to provide care and prevent deaths. Be it COVID or not, we're not in clinic when we have COVID. Further delaying our patients from receiving their care and then further exasper as exacerbating disparities because the people that are actually able to get in and switch doctors are usually people that have more access and advocacy. Our individual actions matter. If we have something that's freely available to all of us, including an N95 and a surgical mask, we wear them. That's my stance. If we're in healthcare, we protect people, regardless of what facet we're in but people are going by these national policies. Health has become political, health is political, gun control is political. These things that directly affect us on the front lines are political. But we need to take the reins back if we are working with patients, for patients to advance science, to advance health, and think about how these policies are not representative of what we know to be true and right in our fight towards health equity and health for our people and health for one another. Even the policies at Stanford, right? Their, their hands are tied. You can be unmasked. In non-medical buildings, in clinic, what am I doing? Yesterday, double masked, required to wear a face shield within three feet of patients who are also masked. If you take a hard look at what we're doing in clinic and what we're doing when we're face-to-face -face with patients, why then is it okay for me to go to my building on Porter Drive and be unmasked around other individuals who potentially are at risk or who potentially are at risk for making me sick and causing downstream effect on patients? Why as leaders of cancer, are we choosing to have an ask, a, a mask optional meeting just because the CDC says it's okay to be unmasked? We all know the devastation for people with cancer is much higher with COVID. And for me, people with lung cancer, I did not go to medical school, nor did I spend multiple years, 21 years, in school and fellowship to have my patient with cancer die from COVID. 
because of my action. It was shocking to me that this is what has become of society, that we're going to just get rid of something that we know helps. Because if it didn't help, don't you think in clinic, all of us in doing research, patient facing, I hope you all are wearing masks, but I thought it was mandated in clinic that our hospitals are still requiring masks. That was never, we never had to wear masks before, but yeah, we're still wearing them. So clearly there's enough evidence and I have a picture of that. So I, I Thursday night have been trying to channel my energy. A couple of weeks ago on a Thursday, I just decided to blast out this email and I sent it to everybody on you. And I got 200 signatures and they still didn't change the mandate. And what the, the CEO of ASCO called me and said, Manali, your view is one out of 45,000. And people are complaining about the fact that we are requiring vaccination. Your colleagues, your oncologists are complaining about this. We are a medical community, we represent patients. And so I galvanized patients and we were able to change. Just last night, I got an email saying that it's now changed from optional mask to expected. We expect all attendees to be masked and there'll be masks available at the front door. 12 days in my career at line, because this clearly is a debate with the CEO. He called me on his cell phone. CEO of ASCO, right, 45,000 person organization and multiple things I'm sure that he has to take care of. So, um, but it was worth it because while masks may not be the only way to prevent, and many people forget that when you're in clinic buildings and you take your mask off, so a lot of this is prevention and awareness to patients. In my clinic, I spend a lot of time telling patients that when you're indoors, you are at risk, so do not take your mask off indoors to eat. COVID doesn't wait until you finish eating or drinking. But these messages are garbled in funding strategies. For example, being able to smoke on my high school campus. Is that the right action? Is that the right behavior? We all know no. But there are all these layers of structures in that circle, which is not a concentric circle. They're all mixed and matched. And it's this circle of mess that pretends the policies in place when we as healthcare professionals, and you all are healthcare professionals, know deep down that the policies are not always indicative of what we should and should not do if we care about the people that we represent on the other side of research. I have yet to take off my mask indoors. I have yet to eat indoors. And that's my personal choice, but it's also my duty as a citizen and as a doctor, as a patient, and as a caregiver of two people with cancer in my family and as a mom. to make health a human right. And then it was official. You can make a difference in your individual actions. For each patient that you have involved in a study, think about the problems. Think about health equity, take action, even if it's not popular. Confront when you see that things are wrong in your protocols. If you find that there's some institutional level of people perhaps needing specific insurance or needing to pay for specific things, call it out. And think about how we can partner with our community organizations. And then last, think about your own actions. You may choose to mask up, you may choose not, it's a political issue, but think about every action that you make and the downstream consequences. They may be really far downstream and you may not even think about it, but it really requires you to put health equity as a lens, as a priority, especially in cancer care and thinking about currently in our public health crisis now with monkeypox, what actions can you take and lead and show your community 
and show by actions how you're leading as a healthcare professional to protect the health of the individuals that we were privileged to be able to do so. I'm gonna stop there. That was a lot of preaching. So um, I've gotten in a lot of trouble, just got in trouble this past week. It led to a better outcome, but certainly has affected my ability, um, you know, probably in that organization to continue along. But I'm glad because that was necessary trouble for me to make in the words of John Lewis, where even one preventable COVID infection for me is enough. One, I may not be able to prevent all of them, but even one for that one person. And yes, public health, medicine, they are at odds. Public health is public health minded, thinking about the greater good for everybody, but it's a very simple action that we can take. And it's also a leadership action as an organization that represents people with cancer. Knowing the devastation, simple ask, why is it a question? Future research, come join my team. We're all not like me. So not everyone's very much um, bent on these, um, you know, they're, they're a little bit less uh, preachy than me, but um, we've got a growing team. It's called the, um, Partnerships to Advance Cancer Care, to Advance Cancer Care. And this is our nurse practitioner at the VA. We have a huge team at Stanford. We do tons of community-based research. I didn't speak about that today, but certainly um, would love for you all to go to our website and see if this would be something you're interested in. We also have volunteers and folks that are learning how to do um, integrate equity into their research, even if it's not directly related. Um, research directions, tons in cancer in terms of interventions. I talked about immune therapies. There's a lot going on at Stanford and nationally. There's um, tons of research through the NIH that's now decentralized. So that's another area that I've been working on for a long time is trying to think about decentralizing clinical trials, bringing them closer to people, the um, electronic consent. So COVID jump started a lot of this. We have a national statement um, available that shows kind of some of the recommendations that we can make to try to decentralize clinical trials through ASCO. Um, there are lots of observ observational studies. We've got data sets um, through our state in California that you can access if you have outcomes or want to look at outcomes, for example, um, following people and having that long span of time where you're not actually collecting the data, but there is data available. We do work on that, but so do many others at Stanford. Um, COVID-19 and cancer is a big hot topic. We know um, that we don't have a lot of data, but we need it. And so that's an area of future research direction. And again, all the stuff that we have going on in my own group. And I'm gonna stop there. I would love to hear questions or thoughts. Thank you so much. This was really uh, very informative and uh, very comprehensive. Uh, primer on oncology truly beyond the basics <laughs> so really appreciate especially the disparity part uh, was really eye-opening and also very relevant to our time these days uh, with all that is happening um i have a couple of questions uh, here and i also see two comments uh, in the chats one comment is about the uh, you know um the uh Sorry, I forgot the name. Um, the the person uh, oh, you Paul Farmer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so he's saying that I love the power of proactive intervention and empowering patients with access to the right care at the right time. And he was the major reason I went to medical school as well. And we have another comment that today is actually the anniversary of uh, George Floyd's uh, murder two years ago. So. Um, so that's two comments. And I also have a private question to me. Well, of course, that was mostly covered COVID and cancer increase, uh, um, because that's the question that you answered. So I will skip that. Um, there is a question about um, how do you psychologically deal with cancer patients day in and day out? Um, uh, because as in research, we also need to be able to manage that effect on us. 
It is really hard. And, you know, I think it's not something that I have figured out the secret sauce for, um, but something that is extremely important. I know that many of you all have heard about healthcare burnout and healthcare worker burnout, and you all are on the front lines experiencing those as, as well. Um, my research staff, because I do a lot of work with community health workers as well, we have um, grief sessions. So um, I know that a lot of people try to desen desensitize to these um, deaths, but for me, it's still not been an area that I have quite understood how to do it. And I actually think the more you desensitize, the less likely it is that you may be able to move forward, meaning think about how and what we do kind of pretends into action. So I don't ever want to become so desensitized that I, I forget about um, death and the meaning of life. Um, so luckily my research, which I didn't talk about, um, is focused on end of life cancer care delivery and um, how to engage patients upstream in end of life cancer discussions, even when it may be many years from when they may pass away. And that has given me a lot of hope because I see people die um, beautifully and die with goal concordance. And that has made it easier and has been a therapeutic tool for me in my own work to handle the deaths of so many individuals and you know, at least comprehend what to do. So I feel like I've channeled that upset and sadness into action and that has helped me move forward. But like I said, I think what I do for my research staff is we have a, um, a grief counselor and if they don't want me to be present, I'm not present, um, where they are able to discuss and get tips and also have a safe forum to discuss what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, what they may be experiencing in their own life. I obviously am not desensitized because I cried during this presentation. You know, I really care about people and one death that's preventable is really hard for me, but um, I think really thinking about how you can make their lives better when they're here and also making sure that you're taking the time out to have support networks that help you as well. And so if you need resources, I've got a list of individuals that have been helping and grief counselors, but I would argue that if you do come across this often that you should set this up within your own labs or ask PIs to help. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Can you speak a little bit more about the correlation between infection and cancer, how infection turns yeah. into cancer? Yeah, so this is a good, good um, question because there is, I think, a, a very clear linkage and we know for sure with HPV and cervical cancer. So cervical cancer, I also didn't talk about this. When I was in medical school and in public health school, we did not know that cervical cancer was caused by a, a sexually transmitted illness, HPV. And um, I went during my master's degree, you have to do a thesis. So I went to Honduras and um, thought I would be working in diabetes since I was an budding in internist and the community came up and said, no, we're, we see lots of our um, women in our community dying from cervical cancer. And I knew very, very little about cervical cancer. You know, I was in medical school. So I got two budding ob um, folks and we all band together. We went down, we created a, a pap smear where we trained um, women from the community to do pap smears. Um, and so it's called the Honduras Health Alliance, if you want to look it up. But those pap smears then allowed the community to get prevention of something that now turns out to be an infection. And it makes sense now why there was so much cervical cancer because of the mobility of migrant farm workers leaving the community and perhaps bringing back STIs that then were affecting these small villages where the women had never left rather than it being a genetic issue. Um, that linkage was made, but much way too late. And it has important implications in terms of pretending treatment options. So now it's part of prevention strategies where people are vaccinated. I think a lot of infection, and there's great groups at Stanford looking at this in terms of infection and cancer because of this revved up immune system you can imagine that if you have an infection, you're probably utilizing the cells, your immune cells a lot. And there's probably likelihood for those uncontrolled growths to happen. So there is likely a, a linkage, but not as great as I would expect and requires many smarter people than me um, who are doing research in this area to understand. We also know that there's um, linkages with certain um, tumors in, in Africa. So for example, EBV, the EBV virus is 
um, well known to be linked, but that linkage is not clear across all and there's definitely much more that needs to be done in that area. Very good question. Wonderful, thank you. And also we have a hand raised, Samuel, um, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, I'm on my, my iPad, so it's not a great video, but can you hear me okay? I can, yes. That's great. So thank you for your wonderful presentation. It was very heartfelt. It was a lot of amazing information and it was, it was interesting to learn about how we can do more, each of us, with health equity. And was curious to hear more about your perspective with um, caregiver integration. Specifically, how do we involve family members and friends? Specifically in oncology, I feel like this is a huge pain point because not only are patients getting sick, but we're inducing symptoms with the therapies and, and it's a huge lifestyle change and loved ones quickly get thrown into it and empowering them, I think is gonna be key and is key. And I'm curious how you, how you help enable them. That is a very good question. So, um, and one that I don't know if I'll be able to answer in the time given because it's a whole area and facet of, of um, itself. So you can imagine that caregivers are critically important because that social support component. We found that at least in lung cancer, people that have marital status that are married tend to have better survival from lung cancer because probably the aspect of not only emotional support, but also spousal support. But we've also found that for some, there's discordance, especially at the end of life, but then in terms of what caregivers may want for their loved ones versus what loved ones may want. And this interplay between the two of the loved ones being very worried about being open um, if they are diagnosed with cancer about their concerns for what their treatments may be. And I'm going to bring this back to my mom because my mom, I was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer and, you know, she's going to get treatment, right? We're going to give her chemotherapy. I'm pushing, I'm an on almost an oncologist. And so there was no question in my mind she came to Stanford and um, her doctor was Dr. Frank Stockdale, who was amazing. Um, an older um, gentleman seasoned who spent, had the time to spend an hour with her and somehow uncovered that she was really concerned about losing her hair. And she had never cut her hair. And he spent time with her. And much to my dismay, she chose no chemotherapy. So that was an, a, a, you know, an indication to me that it's not as simple as having, you want what, what we're trying to do in our research is activating patients so that they can be their own advocate and engage in these conversations with their care, caregivers and loved ones. And then at the same time, also having an approach, which we haven't quite figured out yet, but an approach that's dedicated to caregivers about what these terms are and, and have them go through the exercise of trying to figure out it's hard, right? When you're a caregiver and taking care of one's, one that's going through cancer, how to divorce out your own individual views versus what um, someone may be telling. It's very, very complicated. So if you wanna join our team and help us with this, we need it. There's a whole body of caregiver research that is an unmet need. And so that is definitely an area that is uh, future research. And thank you so much for your comments and thank you for your service in medicine. Everyone Absolutely. that's on the call. Thank you, and, and I'll reach out, absolutely. Certainly, please do. Wonderful, thank you. We have one last question here before we end. We are right at the time. Um, so um, Dr. Patel, do you treat Iraq, Afghanistan veterans exposed to burn pits? The VA website states that research does not show evidence of long-term health problems. What are your thoughts on their statements? And I'm going to also send the uh, evaluation for those of you who, um, we, since we are right at the time, for those of you who have to leave, I just want to announce that uh, we will send out an email with the evaluation and with the slide deck and uh, um, access to the recording. And thanks everyone um, for being here. And thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for yes. your time. And we will um, hear your an answer for the question, last question we had. Yeah, so good question. You know, I think it's hard, again, because of the political nation, nature of some of these statements that come out. Um, while there may not be any clear research, the question is what research is being done and how is that research being conducted? 
And perhaps the studies need to be better evaluated or perhaps there need to be other aspects. So for example, if we had waited on that COVID study of understanding what's happening after the health systems had gotten their data, we would never know that these delays are happening because we, we went to the patient themselves and asked. And patients are often the harbinger of what's happening to them in ways that they may not be able to communicate in the way that we speak in terms of health literacy, but they can certainly indicate if there are long-term complications that perhaps we're not looking for. Maybe there is no risk with the burn and with um, severe infection, but perhaps there's a risk with the burn and emotional and mental distress or PTSD, and that was not a question that was looked at. So thinking about the design of the questions really does make a difference in terms of these statements that come out. And so I challenge all of you to really think critically about what your research is designed towards and then where are the gaps of what you're not answering and what lens are you looking through? Um, I disagree with a lot of what we're seeing because we do know that um, there are other aspects of being in the burn pits that do have long-term health consequences and mental and behavioral health is one of them. And it may not be what's considered the right health outcome, but perhaps again, it's not, um, it's the lens that we're looking at it from. I hope that answered at least part of your question. And yeah, please unmute yourself if you want to um, continue this, uh, com, you know, if you have a follow-up question to that, Andrew, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. But uh, again, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you so much, Dr. Patel. This was really uh, very comprehensive and uh, uh, informative for all of us. I uh, really appreciate that. Oh, we have, uh, it seems, one more in the chat. Oh, thank you. Yeah, they're, they're uh, all compliments coming in. Um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Really I know this is different than most talks, but I hope that it was, um, it was helpful. Fantastic. And it helped <laughs> this is also a talk that can be presented at the DEI, you know, talks, uh, the, the diversity and equity and inclusion um, talks. It's very relevant and timely. And uh, cancer is, uh, um, as you mentioned, one of the top... Uh, yeah, so definitely it's it's an important topic. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you for really the opportunity. Appreciate your time um, and hope to uh, see you again sometime soon. I hope so. Thank you again. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.